Okay, I suppose we should go ahead and begin here. So I'm Robert Heath, this is Wireless Communications Lab, lecture number 12. Uh, I forgot my nice uh, sheets today, left them at the printer, unfortunately. I know, I know. I was going to go back, come in five minutes late with those sheets, but I made a strategic decision. What's that? I said, as you see, we would have joined in a five minutes late situation. I know, yes, yes. No, you did get here on time. That's, that was good. All right. Uh, so first of all, I want to uh, just review briefly this idea of least squares, because we're going to use that several times today. And I just um, quickly finished it at the end of the last lecture. So the, the main place I want to start here, so first of all, remember that the least squares problem was about solving an overdetermined system of equations, overdetermined meaning that A is tall, so that we have too many equations and possibly can't satisfy it exactly. And what we showed on Monday was that through a series of steps using this matrix calculus, and I also want to highlight one, one piece I missed there. One was that we found that A star A x minus a star b should be equal to zero through that, you know, the process of differentiating this least squares cost function, which consists of minimizing the error between ax and b. Now, one piece that I, I forgot to mention last time was that you can simplify this and rewrite this as ax minus b equals zero. And this equation believe it or not, how also has a name, which is called the orthogonality condition. And why this is important is that this ax minus b, this is going to be our error term. And so what this says is that the optimum x here has this property that the error is orthogonal to so this is A conjugate transpose. So this means that the error vector is orthogonal to the columns of A. And since it's orthogonal to the columns of A, it's, it's orthogonal to any linear combination of the columns of A, which is the span of A. So it's orthogonal to the space spanned by the columns of A. Now, by moving this Moving this b to the other side, we got the normal equations, which were a star a x equals a star b. And then solving, we found that x least squares was a star a inverse a star b here. And this is the pseudo inverse here of a. Now what's important to remember with least squares is this graphical picture here. Now this right here, this plane here, is what is called the span of A. This is the set of all possible linear combinations of AX. So this is, you can think about this as AX for, for all X in CM here. So this is where our solution has to lie. And the problem is that we're given another vector here, b. And we want ax to be equal to b. But because the vector b lives in a higher dimensional space, and ax is constrained because we don't have as many columns as rows of a, this is typically lower dimension. So this is like m-dimensional. This is n-dimensional, n being greater than m here. And so the least square solution tells us that this error vector here, so let's call this, this right here is going to be a x l s here. And then this is the error, which is a, which should be b minus a x l s here. And then what we get from the the visualization of the least square solution is that, sort of, is that this error here is orthogonal to 
the space spanned by these columns of A here. And in particular, the A least squares is the orthogonal projection of this point. So this is the closest point to the vector of B that lives inside this space here. And that's A um, XLS here. And then substituting in, we remember that A XLS is A A star A inverse A star B. And so this right here is a projection operator that takes B and finds exactly this closest point in the space spanned by the columns of A. And then this arrow term here, if you rewrite that error vector, you'll see that this is I minus A a star A inverse, A star B, A star times B, and this is the projection onto the orthogonal complement of A, which is basically the space spanned by the um, vectors that are not living in the span of A here. So I'll write that like this here. So essentially, that's what I mean, least squares in terms of visual. And one thing that we can do, which I also didn't do last time, was give the expression for the least square error. Maybe I did it here. But if we substitute in for A least squares, and we use that orthogonality property, then we find that the, um, the squared error is uh, let's see here. It's going to be B star B minus B star A, A star A inverse A star B here. So we can come up with an exact expression of the length of this vector right here, which is just the norm of this vector here. So that's essentially summary of here of least squares. So if we come up with a problem that we can formulate in a set of equations A, X, B, where X is the unknown, then we have the set of the, the least square solution already at hand of that problem. And then we have some properties of the solution, and we know the resulting error. So before I move on here, any questions about least squares here? I guess no. Okay, so now we move on to, let's see here, frequency flat channels. So we're going to focus in particular on frequency flat channel estimation right now. Oh, as I said, it looks nicer than the printed ones. Hmm. Okay, so the story starts here with just what is this definition of frequency flat channel, and then what does it mean to estimate and correct for it here? So we start off with the um, assumption that we've corrected all of the synchronization problems. So assuming the symbol and frame sync have been performed, and assuming they've been performed correctly, what we know from the lecture, uh, the previous lecture, is that the resulting input-output equation in discrete time, we can write as y of n equals square root of ex, alpha e to the j theta, s of n plus v of n here. And so far, we haven't dealt with this alpha and this e to the j theta, the attenuation of the channel. So what we're going to do right now is we are going to combine together the square root of ex, the alpha and the e to the j theta, into 
a complex constant that we're going to call H, and this H will be the channel, the equivalent channel here. Now, why we put the square root of EX into the channel, there's going to be times where I put it in the channel and times that I don't. The reason I'm putting it in the channel now is that from a signal processing perspective, it's really irrelevant what is square root of EX and what is alpha, because all we actually care about is the product of all three, because that's what we're going to need to estimate and remove. So it really doesn't matter um, that we know square root of EX explicitly or not, because even if you know square root of EX, you don't know the alpha. So we might as well just lump them all together into one um, channel. And then we get this very standard equation that looks like y of n equals h s of n plus v of n here. And if you look at um, you know, a lot of really basic papers on in the area of signal processing for communications, you'll see an equation that looks something like this here. And so the, the channel itself, it, we call it frequency flat because um, if you take the Fourier transform of this, right, you get um, something that is constant in frequency here. Because effectively, the channel is h you know, delta of n. So that goes to h you know, in frequency here. So that's, that's the notion of flat here. This will make more sense when we talk about frequency selective later today. OK, so now, assuming this is all true here, then the question is, how do we deal with the H? So the problem is that the channel is unknown to the receiver. And we'll see later in the course that not only is H unknown, it varies. And it may vary 1,000 times a second. So it's varying quickly. There's a couple different ways to deal with the fact that H is, um, the channel is varying here. So alternative one would be to use a, let's say a robust modulation technique. And such techniques, uh, for example, would be like differential, differential QPSK. Now, the, the disadvantage of these techniques is that they're generally, they, they do allow the channel to vary, at least slowly, without having to be explicitly incorporated. But the perform resulting performance is um, not nearly as good as if you do something a little bit smarter. And these are not widely used anymore in wireless systems. So the second alternative is going to be to estimate H and incorporate it into the detector. And so that's the approach that we're going to take in this class. And this concept is what's used in all, um, at least the, the most commercial wireless systems, 802.11, cellular systems. Um, the robust modulation techniques haven't been used in cellular since one of the early 2G systems. Um, so they're, they're not all that common anymore. So what we want to do is um, we're going to break this problem into two pieces. The, the problem one is going to be, let's estimate this unknown channel. And problem two is going to be, let's incorporate it into the detector. So that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to first look at channel estimation. So channel estimation, we're going to do it again later today. We're going to do it again in a couple more lectures. It's going to be um, you know, a big part of what we do in the class and also what you implement in the lab um, because it's important. You know, in a communication system, from a signal processing perspective, I mean, we, we have to have some idea what these unknown parameters are if we want to fix it and get the best performance. That's basically the idea. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to leverage what we used for frame synchronization, which is a set of known training symbols. 
So let's say t of n here, n equals 0 to nt minus 1. And so just as a rem reminder, these are symbols known to both the receiver and the transmitter. Transmitter has to know them because it sticks it in the transmitted signal, and the receiver um, has to know them so that it can exploit them here. You know, so you end up with some, some set of equations where you've got like, you know, let's say s of 0 equals t of 0, s of nt minus 1 equals t of nt minus 1, and these are known. And then this may be followed by a whole bunch of additional symbols, which are unknown. And this is a typical packet structure. that has some training and some data associated with it here. And so the idea is that we use the first part of this signal here to help us decode the remainder of the data. Okay, so the question is really, how do we use this data, how do we use the known data to estimate the channel, first of all? So there's different ways to do this here. So possible solutions... We can open up a, you know, book on estimation theory. We would see, you know, maximum likelihood. We would also see um, minimum mean squared error. And, and there are, you know, many more. There, there's been a whole uh, cottage industry of researchers that have been coming up with new objective functions, solving them, and coming up with a, you know, supposedly better channel estimate here. There, there's um, different criteria for estimating the channel because um, it's essentially there's just different theories about what, is, what does it mean to have a good estimate. And it's complicated in communication system because really we don't care about the channel estimate. You know, really, we just care about high-quality communication, right? We want to send a lot of data at a low error rate. But that can be very hard to solve, finding the channel estimate that gives me, let's say, the lowest bit error rate. So instead, we use one of these other criteria. Now, the one that we're going to use in class is called linear least squares. And this uh, has the advantage of using exactly the least square structure we just talked about. And this is also satisfies the property that it is considered to be it's the maximum likelihood estimator in Gaussian noise. So why I'm mentioning that here is that um, what I'm going to show you, even though it, it does not have the same statistical elegance of some of the other possible solutions, it turns out that it happens to satisfy this property being the maximum likelihood estimator. If you take an estimation theory class, you'll see that such estimators are very good and um, they're quite useful. And so this also means that in practice, if you use a least squares estimator, it's not completely ridiculous. It's actually it's quite, quite a good option. Okay, so now what we're going to do is just to simply build the least squares channel estimate. So I'm going to start off with um, a squared error function here. So the squared error simply will be, so first of all, I'm going to write everything as a function of A instead of as a function of H, because H is the, the parameter we're trying to estimate. But we can't write an objective function of what we're trying to estimate because we don't know it. That's why we're estimating it here. So we're going to form a, a cost function here. That's what this j is. And it's going to be squared error. So what we're going to do is we're going to sum over all of the samples of training that we have. And we're going to look at the error between y of n, what we observe, and a, our unknown channel, times the training sequence t of n here. And for this to make sense, we're going to look at the squared error. This is complex, so I'm going to put absolute values squared. 
So this is a squared error form, and then our least squares estimate will be equal to the argument that minimizes j of a, and effectively we would need to search over all possible complex scalars. Okay, so the basic approach for solving this um, is that we would rewrite, you know, j of a as the sum, right, y of n minus a t of n. We'd expand this out with the conjugate. And then we would differentiate and set equal to zero. So we would say, you know, and I'm going to skip these steps because I'm going to show you an easier approach here. But the effective approach would be differentiate with respect to the conjugate of A, of J of A, set it equal to zero. And it turns out that that leads to this least squares estimate, which has the following form here. So it has the form of there's a sum of t star n y of n divided by the sum of t star of n t of n here. And so I'll give you the derivation of this in, in a slightly more elegant way than just differentiating in a second here. But before we do that, let's look at this interpretation here. Effectively, what this is, is this is the correlation between y of n and the sequence t of n here. Right, where did we see that on Monday, this, this quantity here? Does anyone remember? In the frame synchronization, yes. So it turns out that when you, when you do the frame synchronization, when you have synchronized the frame, you have already acquired this correlation value because you had to find the maximum value of it here. So here's the correlation value. And this right here is just a normalization, right? This is just essentially the energy that's contained in the symbols T. So we're just factoring that energy out. So that's the interpretation here. So that's correlation. And this right here is normalization. Now to see how one can get this using what we've already learned with least squares. Let's take a different approach here. So effectively what we've got is we've got this equation y of n equals h s of n plus v of n here. And we know that s of n is equal to t of n, for example, for n equals 0 to 1 to n t minus 1, right? I'm putting the training at the beginning. The training can occur anywhere. You just have to change the indexing. So don't, don't get hung up on that I'm starting at zero. Just convenient. So what we do here is we write down a set of equations for, you know, what's, what's we know here. So effectively, we, ha we know that y0 equals h times t of zero plus noise. y1 is equal to h times t of one plus noise and so on, down through y of nt minus 1 equals h t of nt minus 1 plus this noise here. Now, the things that we don't know, we don't know the channel, and we don't know the noise. And so what we decide to do here is to say, well, let's just ignore the noise and look at this that I've got a whole bunch of observations y and a bunch of known signals t here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this y here into a vector. And I'm going to say, OK, I would like this vector y to be equal to, you know, so ideally this, well, I'll, I guess I'll write it like this here. So this vector y is equal to h times this vector t of 0, t of 1 down through t of nt minus 1, plus this noise here. Now, 
what we're going to do here, so typical least squares problem, because there's nothing statistical about least squares, there's no expectation anywhere, we can't deal with noise. And so we're just going to neglect the noise, and we're going to formulate this as a least squares problem. So let me call this y, let me call this t, and I'm going to say, hey, what if we solve the problem y equals a t, and we find the least squares solution. So we find the a such that j of a is equal to, so, such that we, we minimize our cost function, which is going to be y minus a t squared. So h least squares will be equal to the arg min of y minus a t squared here. So all I've done is I've just rewritten, effectively, you can show that this JA here is exactly the same as this JA here. I've just written it in vector form, that's all, right? So if we look at this here, this is the sum of the squared entries of the vector. Each entry of this is Y of N minus A times T of N here. So this is just a different way of writing this here. But by writing it like this, then we just go through here and we just plug in this very simple solution that we already had, right? So we know that from the least squares work that we did already, this T here is playing the role of our matrix A. So that we, and then, um, no, let me think here. And then Y is playing the role of B. So we know the solution already, which is going to be a star A inverse A star B, which in this case ends up being T star T inverse T star Y. Now, let's look at exactly what this is here. Well, T star T, T is a vector, so T star C is a scalar. That's the inverse. That's exactly the sum of T of N squared. And this right here, this is exactly the correlation. So this is just the sum from n0 to t minus 1, t of n star y of n here. So that's it. So I mean, the least square solution gives us the, the least square channel estimate right here. And, it's just, um, and, and so what we'll do is we're going to look at a more complicated estimation problem momentarily, and we're going to formulate it in the same way and solve it in the same way, and we'll get something that looks slightly more complicated than this. So any questions about this here? No? Okay. Then let's shift to the um, second part of this, which is just going to be how do we get rid of that channel here? So how to so exploit knowledge of, of the channel here. So supposing we know it perfectly, then what we have is we have a detection problem that looks like this, y of n equals h s of n plus v of n here, where v of n is Gaussian noise. And you can go through and show that the same procedure that we applied before, so if we de derive the ML detector, given h, then you can show that the corresponding ML detector would give you that we solve this argmin of S in my constellations, the difference between Y of N minus H S norm squared here, or absolute value squared, if you like. So this is, and note that this is given the channel, and assuming that it's known perfectly. If it was not known perfectly and you had a model for the error, one could derive a different criterion that um, would have potentially different performance. So effectively, all we do is we take our symbol S, we scale it by the channel, and then we compute the difference between Y of N. 
and h times s here. And so if you were doing this in, in LabVIEW, for example, you know, a reasonable approach might be to take the constellation, distort it by h, and then use it for, you know, the next hundred symbols. So you don't necessarily want to do this multiplication each time, but it depends on how fast this, this is changing here. Now, the other thing I want to mention is that um, in some cases, this can actually be simplified here. And this is one of those. So assume that h is not equal to 0, which makes sense because it's just some continuous random variable that comes from the environment. So for it to be 0, we'd have to be essentially in a Faraday cage or in a very, very unfavorable propagation environment. So assuming it's not 0, then we can rewrite this argmin here as we can just factor out the the h here. So I'm just going to pull out an h. So I'm just going to rewrite this as y of n divided by h minus s norm of that squared. And so we can just get rid of that channel there. Because again, we're just looking for the minimum value. So what this is right here, this is essentially just we take that received sample, we multiply it by the inverse of our channel estimate here. And this is a very simple example of equalization. And this is nice because then you could use your ML detector that operates just with the constellations here. So you don't have to distort the constellation. You just take the input incoming signal and rescale it. OK, so in summary here, what we have is a new receiver block diagram for flat fading channels here. So we have our incoming signal coming in, being sampled at greater than the Nyquist rate. Still have our match filter. We have at the output of our match filter, a correction to pick up the, the proper symbol timing. So we have this little symbol synchronization block running here, driving that. Downsampling by M. And we have, uh, hmm, uh, 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 just realizing now a lot of times I, I write this on landscape. Now I know why. This is Z to the, I forget what I used here, let's call it D hat here. So that's also a delay, and that's a frame sync delay, which happens here. Now I take the output of this, and I multiply it by the inverse of my channel. So I have a channel estimate block here. And then, shoot, I'm going to go down here. Not very elegant, but then I have my symbol detect block. And then the inverse symbol mapping block. So the new thing that we introduced today was essentially this block right here. This is what we didn't have on Monday. Now notice that because we have a correlation in the frame synchronization algorithm I presented to you and also in the channel estimation algorithm, this, this could potentially be one block here that spits out both the frame sync and the channel estimate. You know, that could easily be just combined together. But for the, the sake of the drawing, I'm going to make them separate blocks here. So, so that's essentially what's happening to the receiver here. So filtering, symbol synchronization, frame synchronization, channel estimation, and then the usual detection. So any questions about this block diagram here? There's no questions here. Hmm. Let's come later, yeah. 
That's, a, that's okay, yeah. I mean, midterm number two. I'll have some questions if no one has them for me. Even if you have them for me, I'll still have questions for you on the midterm. Is everyone realizing that I'm just taking note of all the questions I get and then asking that again on the midterm? <laughs> I mean, that makes sense, right? Why, why would I ask you a question that I know everyone knows the answer to? Wouldn't it be fun? Yeah. Then I'll have to do my best here to guess. And I could, oh, ask the TA. What did people miss on the homework? I can't imagine doing that. Yeah. All right, uh, I guess I'll, I'll stop for a minute here since there's no questions. Of course, there will be no discussion about this, but let's see anyway here. I, I found this kind of interesting, what I saw this morning. I don't know how many of you have seen this advertised. I mean, this just came out a couple hours ago, but there's been rumors of it here. So this is a new uh, Galaxy phone they call the Galaxy Round. This is a Samsung phone. And what's interesting about it is that um, is the profile here. Right, so here's the here's the standard phone profile is see flat, and that is curved. So they're using their their um, organic LED technology to create a curved display, and thus a curved phone. So it's sort of interesting looking. The um, the one intriguing gimmick that they mention here that you can do with the fact that it's curved is that you can, for example, go backwards and forwards in the photo gallery or in the musical, in the music app by pushing it up and down, by rocking it. So that's cool. You know, it's like sitting here. You kind of like rock it back and forth and change. I don't know, though. That's just kind of a novelty here. How often do you have your phone like sitting on the, the desk? Any thoughts on this here? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a, little, a little perplexed at, yeah, exactly why. Yeah, that that I mean, this is for the Note, which is um, which is pretty big. This is like a 5.7 inch um, display, I think. So yeah, 5.7 inches, right? So this this is like another this is another inch bigger than this. It's about that big. So yeah. Yeah. Well, that, okay, that, that actually is a good point. One of the, the benefits of this display technology is that it's very flexible. And so it um, you know, potentially won't break as easily. Of course, the thing that's breaking on our phones is the glass that's covering the LED. It's not really the LED itself. Yes, so comment in the back. I wonder from a physics perspective, maybe the curved shape somehow does lend itself to better strength. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. We are in the like the mechanical engineering building. That's that's a good observation here. Um, I know nothing about mechanical engineering, so can't speculate on that. Physics. Physics. I've heard about that. <laughs> yeah. So I I don't know. I mean, it's sort of. I mean, it looks cool, but yeah, I'm still, I'm still trying to. I mean, yeah, I guess if you're holding it, it fits slightly better in the hand. But then, if you're talking on it, I don't know. I mean, hmm. anyone here would want to buy one of these? Come on, you know, there's like half of you want to buy it, <laughs> or we get it for free with your plan. Um, they're charging like I think the unlocked price for it is a thousand bucks. Yeah, and they're not selling it. Um, they're only selling it in uh, South Korea right now. Not selling it in the U.S. Apparently, they don't have a high volume production yet. So I guess they're going to sell it there and just you know see see how it goes. Yeah, we never get like this the top technology first anymore. Really annoying. We should get this too. Hmm. I'm not, but by having it, then I will give you a better perspective on why it might be interesting or not, you see. 
Unfortunately, UT does not let me buy phones anymore. So I used to every year was buying a new phone because I had to have it to understand the technology. Now I'm no longer allowed to do that, me and the other 3,000 faculty who were doing that as well. So, I don't know. I just, yeah, I don't want to rock it, but I don't know. Maybe, 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 there's, maybe, there's, something, maybe there's something else here. I mean, you know, the, the way the thumb works, it sort of goes, see, look, see, it goes kind of in a curve there, see? Maybe that's how they designed the curve. I mean, there's, yeah. Um, on one other note, I remember that Google was working on some at some point. I don't remember if it came out on the first screen, but in the opposite direction, in the kind of yeah. directions on the phone um, for use more as a movie player. And the thought behind that originally was that um, due to the curved screen, it held at a kind of controlled uh, distance from the mm -hmm. viewer, that the crossing sight lines from the two eyes were both normal to the surface. Mm -hmm. on the phone, so you wouldn't, at least I would not get a different, mm -hmm. um, have basically a different viewing angle with the pixel. Mm -hmm. Because I guess, you know, the color of the image changes um, dependent on your viewing angle to the pixels. Mm -hmm. That was their thought behind it, but I don't remember if that ever materialized. Yeah. Probably not. I haven't seen that. I mean, LG also announced a curved phone, too. So I think everyone's jumping on the curved phone bandwagon. And also remember that I showed that um, Android watch uh, a few weeks ago. That was curved in the other direction, too. So that was curved like this. So. <laughs> anyway, this is the future here. We're experiencing it right now. Oh, yeah, and by the way, this, this phone here, I want to tell you, it has... Um, Sorry to say, it does have synchronization and channel estimation and detection. Even though it's curved, it's still in there. That's right. Okay, so let's look at a more complicated propagation channel now. So let's go for, where are we here? Yeah, frequency selected channel, okay. Frequency selective. Selective channel. Yeah, this one doesn't look as good. Hmm. All right. Um, now, there's like a thus far a disconnect between what we've talked about in the earlier lectures when we derived the complex baseband equivalent channel and what I just showed you here. Because we went through, and you went through this pain on the exam of deriving through the complex baseband equivalent of a particular channel. And it's frequency selective, it's an impulse response function. So, and we have, what I just showed you is, is a scalar. So, so we, we have somehow this, this intuition that something here is missing. And so that's what we're going to deal with right now. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to develop a, an appropriate model for this phenomena here. We start off with, you know, so recall that HE of tau is generally, you know, some sort of an impulse response. So it's in impulse response. And what we saw from those derivations earlier, especially when you had multiple taps, is that this in the frequency domain wouldn't be flat. This would be selective in general. And so what this means is that the um, generally the propagation channel we can't model using that flat scalar that I, we just spent so much time driving the estimate for and, and so on and so on here. And that a better model for what's happening between the transmitter and receiver is this complex baseband equivalent here. Now the question now is how can we incorporate this fact into what we do in the signal processing at the receiver? You know, so we know that, okay, the channel, there's an impulse response between the antennas. So what? Well, Let's look and see how that um, gets incorporated into the model here. So, so consider the output 
um, let's say, you know, neglecting synchronization for the moment here. So let's look at the signal y of n here. So consider the output after symbol rate sampling. So what we've got is we've got this transmitted signal with that's riding on top of these pulses here. I'll show you where the um, the sampling comes in here. So here's our pulse amplitude modulated signal. Now, this pulse amplitude modulated signal is convolved with the equivalent channel right here. That is then augmented with noise at the receiver. Remember, noise is not being added in the air. Noise is added in the electronics at the receiver. So it's not like signals flying through air getting noisier. What's happening to the signals that flies through the air is captured by the channel. And then now we take the res they take this signal here and we match filter it by this receive filter here. And then we sample this whole quantity here at some symbol rate here. So what we end up with is um, in discrete time, first of all, we know that the sampled discrete time noise, we are just modeling that as V of N here. So what we end up with is here is we have S of M convolved with this filter G, convolved with another filter H, convolved with another filter G. Here. Oh yeah, and by the way, there is the square root of Vx here. So what we're going to do is we're going to combine the Ex, the G, the H, and the other G all together into one quantity that we'll call H. And then I'm going to write this as, with sampling at NT, I'm going to write this as N. plus V of N, which is just the sum over M, S of M, H of N minus M, plus V of N, where H of T is this new thing. It's not the equivalent channel. It is the receive signal, the receive pulse shaving filter, convolved with the equivalent channel, convolved with the transit pole shaping filter, in this case also scaled by square root of Vx, just because I'm incorporating that into the estimate here. And so from a signal processing perspective, um, you could exploit the fact that you have a, a channel convolved with these particular filters here. That's often not done. Usually we just lump it all together into one big impulse response. And we deal with an input-output relationship that looks like this here. And so this, this equation, y of n, sum over m, s of m, h of n minus m, less noise. This is like a standard model for a discrete time inter symbol interference channel or a frequency selective channel. So this is discrete time ISI system. Now, the main complication here is that instead of receiving S of M, which is what we expected to get before, or S of N here, let's see. So this is what we had before here. Our symbol is scaled, added with noise, and produces the output Y. Now, our symbols are all smeared together by the channel there's additive noise and we get the observation. So we get an, an observation of smeared symbols. 
and that's the main you know, challenge here is essentially unsmearing the symbols. So I'm going to highlight here. So the challenge is you know, is to recover a set of symbols that I've sent from the observations of Y here. And then this can be done in, in several different ways. Here, almost always, we're going to use an approach that's based on estimating the channel. There are some, you know, papers on non-coherent techniques that don't estimate the channel, but they're really, it's just a, a, you know, topic for research at this point here. So there's different approaches here. There's, um, something called maximum likelihood sequence estimation or maximum likelihood sequence detection, what it really should be called here. This is where we try to solve a problem that looks like, believe it or not, argmen of the sum of y of n minus the sum over L, H of L, S of n minus L, norm squared, sum over n. So you try to find a sequence that when convolved with this channel gives you what you've observed. And so there's efficient algorithms for doing that. Um, the alternative that we're going to look at in the class primarily here is linear equalization. And with linear equalization, what we're going to do is we're going to try to find another filter, let's call it F, such that when we convolve that with H, we get something that looks like a delta. Maybe it's a delayed delta. Something like that here. And there's other approaches too. There's, there's something that's called um, decision feedback equalizer. Where you use some you use some combinations of linear equalization and making tentative decisions, subtracting those decisions out and equalizing again. Uh, we may have like a homework problem on that, but we don't usually cover it in the class here. And so the key to all of these three types of receivers is that we need an estimate of the channel coefficients. So now we're going to focus on channel estimation. So, so before we do that, any question on just the problem itself, like, like how we got that input-output relationship, why it's hard? OK, so now we're to frequency selective channel estimation. And this we're going to do um, very efficiently with least squares. So you should be able to construct a set of equations, find the least squares channel estimate. And we're going to go through it in um, shockingly little time, if you can believe it. If shockingly is even a word, which it may not be. OK, so we want to estimate channel here. So generally here, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to make um, one key assumption here is that we're going to assume that the channel is causal and FIR. Assuming that's causal makes sense because in reality, all these filtering operations all are going to have to be done in a causal way. The propagation environment itself has to be causal because it doesn't predict the future. So in reality, the whole filter really is well modeled as being causal. FIR is, isn't just an approximation because we know that if we especially we have like a sink pulse shaving filter, for example, that's not FIR. But practically, at some point, the effect of the channel will be so small that it falls below the noise. And so, so practically, we don't have to consider 
an infinite number of taps, only a finite number of taps, such that at some point the taps become very small. And we'll quantify this notion uh, when we talk about delay spread and channel modeling. So suffice it to say that in many systems, we'll end up with a number of taps that's, say, from four or five, like in GSM, up to you know, 16, which is using AO211N, or potentially more. But it's typically on that order of, you know, fives, tens, it, it could be more. And so by assuming that, we can write the input-output relationship as follows. The main difference being that I'm incorporating the finite memory and the FIR property here. And so L, which I will, I can't remember if I call it LH here. Let's see. L Yeah, elsewhere, okay, I'm going to leave it as L for now. Sometimes I call it LH, but L is the order of the channel. So it's not the length. The length is L plus 1. So it's 0 to L, not 0 to L minus 1. Okay, so now let's, we have the system model here, and we're going to, again, suppose that we have known training symbols, T of 0 through t of n, t minus 1. And in particular, we're supposing that t0 is equal to s0 down through n, t minus 1 equals t of n, t minus 1. Ah. All right, this is important here. OK, so now, so the, the main trick with solving this here, I mean, we're going to use least squares. That's probably given at this point. The main trick that you have to recognize is that we only know the training. That's all we know. We can't use observations that are contaminated by symbols that we don't know. To illustrate. So let's start off with this set of equations here. Let's start off with, let's see here. So let's start off with y0. y0 is equal to, and I'll write this out, write out this convolution here. This is h of 0 times s of 0 plus h of 1 times s of minus 1 plus dot 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 plus h of l s of minus l. Now if my training starts at s 0, wh what do I know about s minus 1? That would be the symbol that came before the training. Or it might be nothing. We don't know what it is. So we cannot use that. Don't know. So we can't use y0, because it's contaminated by information we don't know. So we just keep going here. Eventually, we get to y of l. y of l looks like this. y h0 s of l plus h of 1 s of l minus 1 plus dot dot dot. Sorry, I forgot the noise here, but that's always there. Down to h of l s of 0 plus noise. So note here that this is S of L, which corresponds to TL. This is T of L minus 1. This is T of 0 here. So here, I'm in good shape. I can use this Y of L, because it's a combination of everything I know and noise, which we don't have any hope of knowing anyway. Okay, so continuing on here, <clears throat> you can hopefully see that we can use up through y of n t minus 1. And y of n t minus 1 will be h of 0, s of n t minus 1, plus dot dot dot, h of l, s of n t minus 1, minus l, plus v of n t minus 1. And then if we keep going, y of nt, we're going to get h s of nt plus h1 s of nt minus 1 plus dot dot dot. This right here, we also don't know what this is here because our training is only from 0 to nt minus 1. So we're stuck here. So essentially, this is the usable 
um, observations that we have. So now the final gain here with using least squares is to do the same trick here where we rewrite this equation here as a function of what we don't know and have a hope of estimating. So what is that? What are we getting? What are we trying to get here? Not trying to get the noise. What is the unknown? Someone remind me here. The unknown? The channel. The channel is the unknown. So in each of these equations here, I have the H0 through HL and some training. In every equation, I have the same unknown training un channel and different training data, potentially. So all we have to do is we just have to rewrite this in vector matrix form. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a special matrix notation here. So first of all, let's let's build, let's take all of our observations, y of l, and we're going to put them all into an observation vector here. That's going to be y. So note that y is not nt long. It's nt minus L. Let's see here's NT L is equal to one. Yes, NT minus L by one is equal to. Could you move just Now here's the thing. With least squares, our unknown has to be a vector. So we're gonna put our unknown right here. H of zero h of 1 down through h of l here. So now all we have to do is populate this matrix using these results here. So look at the first row here. y of l equals h0 times sl, which is tl here. So h0 times tl, h1, tl minus 1, down through hl times t0. <coughs> so given that I have hl down here, we start here. T0, T1, T2, dot, 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 through T of L here. That's like the first row. And then we just continue on. So then this becomes T1, T2, dot, 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 T of L plus 1. This goes all the way down here to T of done this right, it should be nt minus l. Let me check my notes here. To do this right here. Uh, no, shoot. All right. Let's write this out again. Okay, back here. What multiplies H0 is T of L. So we need T of L. T of L minus 1 down through T of 0. T of L plus 1. T of L dot, 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 T of 1. So we end up here with T of NT minus 1 down to T of NT minus 1 minus L here. So let me call this matrix here T. Let me call this unknown here H. Here, this is Y. So therefore, my least square solution is T star T inverse T star Y.
And so that's my estimator here. So what you would do from a central processing perspective is you take your observed samples y, right? You take those samples y, and you multiply them by a matrix. And that gives you your channel estimate. But you have to construct that matrix carefully with this training data here. Now note that this training data is probably not changing. So this whole thing here could be pre-computed. And it can be done uh, very efficiently here if it's pre-computed, right? You don't have to do like a product and an inverse and another product. You can just do it ahead of time. Now, uh, a few observations to make here. One is that this, this matrix here has a lot of structure, right? So you see it's got um, constant diagonals here. So what is this structure called? What's that? No, this is the training data here. Actually, I'm trying to remember also. So I think this is a uh, tuplet structure, essentially having these constant um, terms here on these diagonals. This structure has been exploited for all kinds of interesting reasons. There's whole books on exploiting this special structure. Because this is not a matrix of arbitrary entries. This is a matrix of entries that where all the diagonals are the, are the same. So, so there's a huge amount of structure. There are fast algorithms for playing with this kind of a T. Um, but one thing I do want to note is look at this right here. Look at this product here, T star T. So what is that? Well. What that is, is that's a product between a column of t and another column of t, right, inner product. So what does that look like? Like if I take the inner product between this column and this column. Something that we've talked about before and estimated before. So this, this would be, you'll see this on the homework also, this is a, um, is a correlation between two vectors here. But these two things are different points of the same vector. So it's like I'm correlating this piece of the training with this piece of the training. So, so what's happening here is you can think about this right here as being an estimate of, the, of a training correlation matrix. It's, it's, and then this right here, I'm correlating the training with the observation. We did that already with the scalar. So effectively, what I'm doing is, I'm see this right here? I'm taking pieces of the training data, correlating with the channel, right? So this is the training data. So I take this, I multiply it by the observation. So I correlate my observation with different pieces of the training, and then I multiply through by this inverse of the correlation matrix. Yeah, why am I mentioning all of this here? Well. What if you had a training sequence that, that had you know, really nice properties? Well, if that training sequence was, had properties such that it was, um, well, if this, if this, okay, let's see. If you can imagine if this, this was long enough here and the training sequence had good correlation properties, when you correlated it with itself, this would be roughly an identity matrix here. So, and then this would, you know, effectively be correlating with your y here. So, so a good training sequence has something such that this t star t inverse ends up being close to identity. And there's ways to, to prove this more formally. Um, th and there's also a lot of work on training sequence design. But um, anyway, so it does relate to these problems of, of correlation that we talked about before. Let me see what else I wanted to mention here. Oh, yeah. I mean, just the conditions of, under which this even makes sense. So first of all, this has to be invertible. T star T has to be invertible here. Which means that T must be full rank here. So you can't pick necessarily an arbitrary training sequence. Like, what if you pick the all-one sequence? 
training sequence all once. That seems easy, right? It's all once. Well, then you populate your whole matrix here with ones, and then you have a matrix that's all ones, that's rank one, it's not full rank, not invertible. So what you want to do is have a training sequence that is somewhat random looking so that this whole matrix here is, is nicely invertible here. Um, and then the other thing is that is the dimensionality. This has to be square or tall. So let's look at the dimensions here. So T is um, NT minus L by L plus 1. Okay, so if we need NT minus 1 to be greater than or equal to L plus 1, that implies that NT should be greater than or equal to L plus 2. Here, actually, no, I've made a mistake here. What have I done here? NT minus L. No, I need the 2L. Yeah, sorry, 2L plus 1. So your training has to be long enough, too, right? If you're trying to estimate a channel with 10 taps, we would say, you know, these are taps here. You would need 21 training symbols at a minimum. Now, further note that, you know, larger NT generally gives better results, lower error. There's probably, you know, you can probably construct some weird training sequence where this isn't true. Like, I have training in a bunch of zeros, which would be stupid. But generally speaking, the more training you have, the lower the error here. Okay. So I think that's it here. So any questions about this, this channel estimation, frequency selective channel estimation? Now, what we haven't gotten to is the equalization. So given that we have like one minute left, I suppose we won't do the equalization today. Even though it could be done in maybe three minutes, we'll, we won't do it today. Uh, but as a preview, we're going to use again a trick like this, except that we're going to um, formulate the equalization problem as a least squares problem. All right, so to summarize here, let's go back through here. So we, we just talked about frequency selective channel estimation. So you should be able to derive that frequency selective channel model and use least squares to estimate the channel. You should be able to compute the error for that. I didn't show you that, but you can compute it. Oh yeah, derive the frequency selective channel model. This is very strange here. I have two page sevens and no page nine. Hmm. Yes, you should be able to estimate the channel and then know this property is here of least squares here. Okay, so that's it. Um, as far as the lecture goes, One announcement I make on the exam that you have until next Monday to submit a